Now the origins of load monitoring happened way back before GPS was even invented, right? Um, and they were manual, they were observational, and they were highly limited in, in the resolution, like how many uh, data points they could get. The first ever uh, published work was Tom Riley's time motion analysis in soccer that he wrote up for his dissertation. All right, um, it relied on stopwatches, coded notation systems, retrospective video validation. So there was a lot of work put into this. And believe me, I was looking at his manuscript actually in preparation for this and just imagining all of those stats that he calculated by hand. And, you know, on, I think like a typewriter or probably like a nascent computer system uh, typed up for his dissertation. And I thought like to do a, to do a scientific dissertation in the 70s was way more difficult than if you were to do one today with uh, with stats programs and with ChatGPT and with you know all of the all of the efficiency tools that we have and not to mention his data collection took hours and hours and hours we he couldn't just download the data from his catapult device uh, it was it wasn't that convenient all right and um, here's a here's a photo of his uh, of the cover of his dissertation you can find it it's open access online um, and read through that if, uh, you know, if you get bored on a Sunday or something. Okay, so let's get into the emergence of wearable technologies and, and where we are today with all of this. So advancements in sports science mirrored broader technological trends, okay, as the rest of the world went with devices getting smaller and smaller and packing more and more into them, um, you know, even in our, in our phones, right, we have so much uh, compute power just right here and cloud-based processing and so it just made sense that the same would happen in sport as well okay so we had the development of optical tracking systems using cameras um, in the late 1990s multi-camera setups capable of reconstructing 2d movement um, across teams simultaneously high resolution but limited because it's only two dimensions um, and limited portability as well all right, then we had wearable microsensors in the early 2000s and onward. This enabled continuous field-based data capture via GPS modules, uh, inertial measurement units like accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers. Um, and this sh uh, led to a shift from team level to individual level profiling. So now we didn't just have to think of the whole team, uh, but we could think of each individual and get very, very nuanced. Okay, so what is GPS technology? We all use it in our phones, or, or most of us probably do. I remember still like when I went to ETSU for, uh, for college or for, for my grad, grad school, I didn't have a smartphone yet. We were, my wife and I were one of the last people of our friend groups to get a, an iPhone. We just had a flip phone. And so we navigated across the country using printed out maps. <laughs> to get from California to Tennessee. And uh, that was one of the last times I ever had to do that because now we have GPS in just about everything. So it tracks position, velocity, and acceleration, as well as derived metrics like for catapult, player load. Player load is a summary of all of the athletes' acceleration in all three planes of, mo of movement, okay, the X, Y, and Z axis. And it's, a, it's um, essentially a summation of all of that. Um, and so looking at something like player load helps you to distinguish the difference between total distance run, okay, because distance, you can cover a lot of distance, but do it in a way that's highly efficient, or, uh, versus the total impact on the body of changes of, of direction, of little steps to the left or to the right, you know, that wouldn't be necessarily adding to their total distance, but it's adding, adding to the stress on the body. And those acceleration movements, those rapid accelerations, those densely packed number of accelerations will add up the player load. Now the accuracy depends on the sampling frequency. Greater than 10 hertz, 10 uh, samples per second, are preferred for field sport application. Any less than that, and we can't really tell what the instantaneous acceleration is with very much granularity. Okay, satellite coverage and signal quality is important. The number of satellites uh, that, are, that you're connecting to. Um, and signal processing algorithms, so filtering it out, smoothing it, it out, data interp interpolation, um, all of those things are important, but we're not going to get too far into it. We just know that research shows um, increasing error with rapid changes in direction and velocity due to derivative-based velocity and acceleration calculation, meaning that if your hertz is too low and the connections are not as good and we have to assume, make a lot of assumptions about the data, then we get... Um, uh, lower resolution but thankfully catapult technology is such that uh, you know their GPS systems are are 
very granular, we get very good data um, that's highly valid and reliable from those systems. Okay, so just a quick comparison table, we've got GPS, which most of us um, think about now when we think about load monitoring, but then there's also optical tracking using camera-based systems. Now, uh, it's not in 3D, um, it's costly. We also have RFID or UWB, which is more for indoor applications. Um, and then IMUs, which are usually um, used in conjunction with RFID or GPS in order to get acceleration data, to get uh, G-forces, and to get positional data, like is the athlete upright or are they on the ground, right? Because of the magnetometer and the gyroscope within them. Now, um, just a couple uh, notes about Catapult. Uh, that's what we use here at the university. Uh, we've had a very good experience with Catapult over the years. Uh, they've, they were really one of the first big movers on the scene and have revolutionized applied sports science by their, the integration of their GPS and IMUs into a single wearable system. Okay, um, and, and there's different uh, levels of Catapult. Um, I'm only really familiar with the ones that we use here. Um, and it, so they range in different uh, hertz and different frequency, but they range from 10 to 18 hertz GPS with triaxial accelerometry, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. Um, and they, one of their propri proprietary metrics that is actually cited quite often in the literature is player load. And as I said, it's a vector summation of acceleration in all three planes. It also has event detection, so you can tell the tackle counts, you can tell the sprint efforts, jump counts, etc. And it became uh, really the industry leader, and I think still is the industry leader, thanks to these things. All right, but let's get into how to use it. Here's, here's what some of the um, systems look like. I just kind of you know pulled these off the internet, um, but I thought since Catapult's sponsoring the the session today that I thought they'd be okay with me showing off their technology. Um, you know, this is what this is what it looks like when uh, one of my grad students opens up the case uh, and has all the units in there. Um, they distribute them to the teams. Uh, I have just a short video at the end showing some of our soccer athletes picking up their their pods before training. And um, in the slides, when I, I'll, I'll send them to Dr. Aperva to distribute as well. In the slides, I have uh, like kind of a step by step of hey, when you get the system. Uh, what, how, what's the actual workflow? And so I'm not going to go through those for time's sake, but I just wanted to include those slides for you. Like step one, you know, uh, prepping it for the session. Step two, distributing the pods, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And like I said, for time's sake, we're going to go a little faster through some of these. This is this is kind of rigor, regurgitation a little bit of what I've said already. So let's talk about some practical measurement strategies. Okay, so um, different types of metrics we might look at um, that we might look at for load um, in order to uh, make good decisions around training. Okay, so we have uh, internal load measures versus external load measures. Quick comparison here, and then the and then the type of metric that we're looking at: field-based. Can we do it on the field? Lab-based, do we have to go to the lab? Um, and then software-derived. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just know that GPS um, and IMUs, and if you have a heart rate monitor system with, uh, with that, because it can function all as a single package, that's going to be field-based internal and external load measures simultaneously. So in my mind, it's the best. It has the highest ecological validity. It has both internal and external, and you can start to triangulate some of those adaptive responses to training and uh, mitigate injury risk and overtraining uh, with a system like that.